Are you struggling with creating video content for your business, side hustle, or YouTube channel? Wave Video is here to help. It's the platform I recommend the most to small business marketers because it's a full suite of tools, video recorder, editor, easy to use templates, screen capturing, live streaming, GIFs, video to email, and believe it or not, even more. With Wave Video, you can easily create professional looking videos for your website, social media, or ad campaigns in just minutes. Wave Video's intuitive drag and drop editor lets you add text, music, and animations to your videos, making them truly stand out from the crowd. So why wait? Sign up for Wave Video today and start creating videos that capture your audience's attention and drive results for your business. Tap the link in the episode description to get 10% off any paid plan. Wave Video. Create better video content in less time. In this episode of the Marketing Clarity Podcast, I am joined by Jeff Greenfield, and he's the co-founder and CEO of Provalytics, and he's built a next generation of attribution, taking into account all of the new privacy regulations and the upcoming cookie apocalypse. So we're going to be talking about how Google Analytics 4 is in. Third-party cookies, they are out. Are we entering a branding renaissance? I, I kind of hope so. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. And major Safari changes. They're good for privacy, but super scary for marketers. So... Without further ado, let's get pedaling. Jeff, thank you so much for joining me. I'm excited because we've been trying to actually connect for a couple of weeks. And <laughs> you, you know, what we're going to talk about in today's episode is stuff that um, I'm really excited about. You know, digital marketing is a world, is an industry where things are constantly changing. And if that's something that as a, as a small business marketer, as a, any size business marketer, you're not okay with, this might not always be the best place for you. If you want to just always just keep doing the same thing and know that it's either going to work or not, digital marketing can sometimes be a tough landscape. And, and to that point, one of the biggest things that's been coming up with my clients and I've just been seeing is all around GA4, okay? Wow. The panic, if you will, around GA4. So maybe you can help to clarify what, why is GA4 a thing? What, why is it in existence? Why is it replacing what, what is traditionally called universal analytics? Well, you know, I'm actually gonna go back and talk a little bit about the word change. Oh, because back. that that Webster's the dictionary deal. defines change. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not that much, but I think there's an important <laughs> lesson because you know it used to be back in the day. If I was an advertiser, I would buy coupons. I'd be in the yellow pages. I'd buy some some print. I'd be in the newspaper. Maybe if I was big enough, I would buy radio ads, and those. Those folks, the business model was always the same. They didn't change. Um, but the digital world is, is controlled by these companies that are drastically shifting and moving, and they're trying to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And as a result, their business models change. And I've been in this field for long enough that I've, I've had this lesson that I, I learned many years ago, which is, is that if you find something in the digital world that's working for you and you find it's been working now for six months, you now have to understand that you are on borrowed time because, because they may, it may last another year or so, but you better find something else because you can't count on it lasting. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to clients and they're like, this was just working Three months ago, it was working great. And now what happened? It's like, well, you know, the overlords, Google or Facebook, have had to change their business practices as a result. So, and that goes along with what we were talking about earlier, Ross, which is, is that this is something, it's a constantly moving and shifting marketplace. And 
there's always new players. Uh, and, it, and it's unlike the days before digital where there weren't like new radio stations opening every month, but there are new sites new players that are coming up that are gathering and garnering attention from eyeballs. And as a result, Facebook and others have to react to that. So I want to put that in place there. And then let's jump over to GA and GA4 because it's important to understand where did Google Analytics come from? So early on, and I'm always a big history buff with this stuff because- I love it. There used to be this, this program out there. It was a free program called Urchin. And it was a web analytics program. And it was really good at tracking how people, what they did when they showed up on your site, what pages were popular, how long they were there. And it was included for free in any server that you would get. You know, back in the day, you couldn't just set up a website. You had to, you had to get a server and this up predated and running. Google Analytics by oh, probably many oh, moons. Right. Like, way, yeah, way. That's right. And then Google acquired Urchin and that's in the history of it this is what's funny about software is that when you buy a piece of software sometimes it doesn't matter how big you are like google but the code is so embedded you just don't change certain things and so everyone who uses google analytics they know about utm source and utm medium and that utm stands for urchin tracking module so yeah that's that's where wow, that's from. i had no idea because they yeah. they they just renamed it. I mean, doesn't it call it universal tracking now? Maybe, but that's maybe, that's what it was started with. Wow, I had no idea. Urchin tracking module because to change the code would be way too much work. So this goes back <laughs> years ago. So what they did is is that they they expanded the product so it could do other things. It could give you more information about people on your site. And then as their ads products started to grow, like Google Search and Google Shopping and Google Display, they made it very easy to integrate those. And then what's happened over the years as well, Google did a very good job as well of creating curriculums for colleges and analytics, which meant people in colleges years ago who didn't know anything about digital, they got trained in web analytics with Google Analytics. And that's why now 98% of all companies use Google Analytics to measure their ad effectiveness. But there's a huge problem with that, which is it's a web analytics product. It's designed to measure how people get to your website and then what they do on your website. So let's talk about how people get to your website. It, Google Analytics does a good job of when someone clicks to make your way to the website, you know where they clicked from. And anyone who opens up their Google Analytics will see that like, 80% of the people just show up organically. <laughs> Hello, ta-da. Yeah. Or, or if you're spending a lot of money, they will come through your Google branded search term. But as a marketer, I don't want to know about people, what they clicked on, because what Google Analytics is showing me that they just came to my homepage. How did those people find out about me? How did they know to search for me? How did they know to click on my brand search term? What ads am I running out there that's doing that? And that's not in Google Analytics because Google Analytics is not media effectiveness. It's just click tracking is all it is. So now let's, so this has been out there for a very long time. You know, 98% of marketers utilize it. And now if we go back just a couple of years ago, there was this thing called GDPR, which are these big changes for privacy that started in the EU. We now have CCPA, the California Consumer Protection Act. And then we've got one in Nevada. We've got one in Maryland. We've got one in just about every state, all of these privacy changes. And so Google has made a lot of changes over the last decade towards that. And the final shift is shifting over to GA4. And so what that means is, is that you have to update your code. You have to do all of these things. Now, what a lot of sites have been doing is they've been running in parallel because the problem is, is that starting in July, when we log into Google Analytics 4, all we're going to have is data in there from the first time we put up the tags. Yeah, so and that's the thing I always told the clients I worked with is even if they weren't ready to deal with, at the time, Google Analytics, 
let's go through and still install the code. Because some right. people erroneously think that, oh, Google just has this information. And then when I quote, hit the button for Google Analytics, it get, oh, then it gives it to me. But this, none of these tools can start collecting data until you uh, essentially install them. And, right. and I got to tell you, like this has been the big panic. To Google's credit, but also discredit, they are hammering you over the head right now that we are in the end game. Oh, you got right? the, the countdown count. It's the, a the, countdown, the, the red banner, like the emails, everything. And, you know, it's funny because as a marketer, sometimes some of the most effective work that you can do is literally when you is heavy handed where you, where you literally like pound people over the head with it. And then of they're course. like, people complain about it, but then it's like, Oh, guess what? We had record sales. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, so I feel like Google is right there when it comes to this GA four transition, because yeah, if you don't get this set up, they are kind of doing this thing where we'll, we'll automatically set it up. Cause they don't want to just leave people out in the lurch but that could be an imperfect setup. But right? here's the like, problem, Ross, is that for clients that I know that have been running GA with GA4 for like the last year even, mm -hmm. they are still only looking at GA. Yeah. They haven't started using GA4. So what's going to happen is that July 2023 is the first full month that people are going to be looking at GA4, that they're not going to have GA data. So what that means is, is that August, when people look at the July data, they're going to have this, oh my God what moment, like hell? what is going on? And then they're going to be like, thank God our bosses aren't here. So that's it's true. August. Yeah. So it's step true because it is not, it is not the same product. That's right. It, it's a completely it, different product. Completely different. It is, I would not even argue, I would just say it doesn't feel as accessible as Google right. Analytics does. Now, that could be a function out of how long Google Analytics has been around, right? right. That has been around for years. It's gone through many updates as and GA4 technically has been around for many years too, but you know, it's been, it's been on the side. We haven't had to deal with it to your point, right. but to, yeah, come July and August, there's going to be a lot of listings, job listings for, well, I think what's going to happen is, is that in September when people's bosses come back from the summer and they look at the data, there's going to be a lot, Hey, we need to find something else, but now we're in Q4. Oh. So I think 2024 is going to be the year where a lot of companies are going to be looking for other things. This is this is a a major disruption in the world of analytics and in the world of attribution, along with all the changes that are going on with the cookies, the recent announcements from Safari that are going to happen. There's all these changes and they're all coming together at once. So this market is having a lot of disruption uh, and it's it's pretty exciting. And it's just, it's just one change after another, after another, all at the same time. It's really incredible. And I, we're not going to talk about it in this pod. I mean, well, we may end up talking about it because it's a, it's, it's the elephant, you know where I'm going. He's already laughing. He knows yeah. where I'm going. The elephant in the room of AI, but you have all of these things, all of these changes. You have the, the analytics trans, like again, with a tool that 90 plus percent of the industry and all people use Google Analytics changing, right? right? People being confused, intimidated, or not getting the same type of data they need. And I think that's a great prediction that we're going to see in Q4, Q1, all of these new searches for new analytic tracking tools and things like that, that are going to either simplify or give better clarity on, on what exactly your marketing is doing. You have the AI revolution kind of on top of that at the same time. And then you have what you mentioned, cookie-less. So I think that's a great transition. Let's talk cookie-less. What does that 
mean other than it sounds like we're going to have a whole bunch of sad kids out there or adults <laughs> for that matter <laughs> I think who are going to go starving because they get no cookies. Yeah, this is definitely going to hit the adults more than the kids because <laughs> the backbone of ad tech has been these third party cookies that allow folks to capture information so that when you're running a marketing campaign, you can know that someone got exposed to and even saw an ad of yours on the New York Times and then clicked on something. So going back to what I was talking about, where you don't know how people are showing up at your site using uh, third party cookies in other platforms besides Google Analytics, you're actually able to tell which ads are actually driving awareness and making people eventually search for you. But when Google has this cookie collapse or the cookie apocalypse next year in 2024, what that means is, 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 is it means we're not gonna be able to tell anymore. And so now we have to step back and say, okay, well, well, this is going to impact both measurement and, and so it's going to impact how we determine what was working and what wasn't working. And it also impacts targeting. And for those marketers that have been around for just a couple of years, it, they remember it wasn't that long ago in Facebook, you could, you could target Ford F-150 owners who leased, whose lease is going oh, to expire in six months. It was insanely deep. Right. Now, deep. One now could the, argue maybe criminally based on all yeah. of their fines. Right. But now you can't do that. And so we have to think about, okay, well, what, what are we going to do? And for a lot of marketers who are primarily digital marketers, uh, they're at a loss. They're like, you know, I'm used to having big data. Yeah. I want to target people at a user level, but we have to go back to the future. We have to go back to the time before digital and think about, you know, how did brands actually grow back then? How were they able to make decisions? How were they able to target? And it turns out that brands actually were able to grow really, really well. The difference was is that instead of them being focused at a user level where you're so deep, you can't see the forest for the trees, they panned back the camera and they actually had a broader perspective on what was driving awareness at the top of the funnel. Yeah. Uh, there's a great book out there that I recommend for everyone who's a marketer. It's called Lemon, How the Advertising Brain Turned Sour by Orlando Wood. It's available on Amazon. It's like 60 bucks for anyone, small, medium, or large business owner. This book will change your perspective on marketing overall. And what they found is that as digital marketing started to grow and as marketers started to move money from awareness type tactics like TV and radio, stuff that was all about brand building, and they moved it to the lower part of the funnel where you could count clicks, what they found is as money moved over and they called that a rise in short-termism, meaning you're focusing on the lower part of the funnel. <laughs> You're trying to grab people who are already in market, grab yeah. people yeah. who may already be ready to buy. And so you see that rise. And as they spent more money there, they saw a decrease in ad effectiveness. And the reason for that is that as, you know, it is a funnel. It's sure. like this. And it's all about the reach. You want to spend more money at the top of the funnel so that you build awareness and bring it on down. When you spend l fewer dollars at the top of the funnel, your funnel is smaller, your reach is less, which means you're actually marketing to fewer people, which means even if you're closing at an incredible rate, your ads have to work much harder so ad effectiveness goes down. That's why I keep saying that branding is the new growth lane for marketers. And Love it. At small business owners, all you have to do is you have to step back and say to yourself, okay, I own a business. You know, I, I'm, I'm the chief bottle washer. I empty the trash and I make all the marketing decisions. And so instead of going to marketing school, all you have to do is step back and maybe read a newspaper every now and then to see what are the big companies, the ones who are spending hundreds of millions of dollars, what are they doing? Especially these like internet-based companies like Airbnb. Mm -hmm. You know what Airbnb did? They stopped all of their lower funnel advertising and they moved to branding 
and they found that their ad effectiveness went up through the roof. And we're starting wow. to see more and more big brands do this. Now, as a small business person, you say, well, how does that, how can I do something like that? Well, instead of focusing just on click ads, start thinking about content ads that you can do in your local area on Facebook and read up on things like VSLs, video sales letters. Those are all content oriented. It's just as simple as sitting there with your iPhone and recording a I video. Mean, isn't that nice though, Jeff, to like get back, have this pendulum swing to get back to, I say, marketing as an art form. I think that's what, how, how marketing bit me. I, I, I did not go to school for marketing. I went to school for communications, which that's essentially what marketing is. But the bug that really bit me was the content creation aspect. And that's what I work with a lot of my clients is being able to tell your story, being able to address your either prospective customers, your current customers, you know, what I call FFPs, fears, frustrations, problems. Uh, the, again, the art form, if you will, of telling stories. That's what always got me into marketing is the storytelling aspect. And so as we talk about potentially the decline slash collapse of this, um, the, the, the cookie, I want to I ask you a question. Do you think that we have been in a, I don't know if we'll call it the golden era. We may look back and not call it the golden era. But do you feel like we've been in an era with digital marketing when we look back on, we're going to be like, man, I cannot believe the unprecedented amount of data that we had during this time period. I mean, do you ever think we'll see this again? And is that a, is that a good or a bad thing? Well, I think what we're going to realize is that this data actually led us in the wrong directions because we were so hyper-focused on the details. And when you're hyper-focused on the details, and because the, there's always errors in data, and you're never going to have complete information. And the problem is, is that most of the models that were built, and I, I built models off of this data back in the mid-2000s, and you make a lot of assumptions. Yes. And those assumptions lead you in the wrong direction. Like, for example, the early attribution companies that were out in the early days of big data they, they were able to tell which ads built awareness, but what they never really answered was which ads actually drove incremental sales. Meaning <laughs> if I hadn't done this ad, how many sales would I've gotten anyway from this mm. ad versus the incremental ad, the incremental sales, which is what people really want. And so now we're entering this era where we're restricted in terms of the amount of data but the advantage is that we can make better suggestions. And that's really what, and you're right about marketing being an art. It is an art and a science. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is because there's so many complexities, so many different places and variations of ads, the science part with the modeling and the machine learning and even a little AI, what it allows us to do is it allows the math and the computers to do the calculations that would take a group of like a hundred human beings several weeks to do. And it can do it over the course of an hour or so. And it allows you to take your art and then use the science to point you in the best direction and then combine those together. Because with the proper science, at least you know directionally you're heading in the right way. Uh, and that's really what this is about is, but, but I'm telling you that all of this data really I think it's done marketers a disservice and it's made a lot of us uh, very lazy and it, and we've lost a lot of the creative juices that come out. If you look at the ads from the last Super Bowl, I mean, essentially it's just like, it's these oh, hypnotic, snoozy. really fast TikTok ads, which, which really kind of, uh, they don't, they don't know. There's the emotional aspect that storytelling used to be all about. You know, it used to be that brands would 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 make ads so that someone who's 18 would aspire to own that product in their 40s. I mean, that's long term thinking. Now, obviously, people today say there's no CFO that's going to support a campaign like that. Oh, it'll pay off in 25 years. But the <laughs> idea is 
to build that type of storytelling into ads is very, very powerful. And it works. It really You does. know, I think maybe as a marketer, I always feel like I like to reward good marketing. And I don't know. I always feel like if that is just because I am a marketer, I think it's like when you're in the service industry and then you go out to eat, you probably tip the wait staff more because it's like tip of the cap, like been there, understand. I've been there. I've been in the trenches. So I feel the same way with good marketing. And to your point about the, the storytelling, you know, I was going through and I got served up a dollar shave club ad the other day and it legit made me laugh. It legit captured my attention. I was watching it on YouTube. I stayed for the whole ad, which how often can you say that? Right. Stay right. for the whole ad. And you know what I did the next day? I did buy dollar shave club. I did. And, and I think maybe I, I am an outlier in that way. But I just feel like I always like to reward the ads that are interesting, the branding that I think is very creative and obviously resonates with me. It can't just, you know, it has makes some sort of connection with me. But I, I just feel like there's so much less of that. There has been so much less of that the last several years. And I, for one, kind of welcome the demise of the cookie. Um, and, you know, I want to take a real quick break, but when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about how all these things are directly impacting Facebook. So before we jump back into this episode, I just want to take a quick second and tell you about a tool that I've been using recently that I absolutely love, and it is called writeblogger.com. It is by far the easiest way to create great content super fast, and it uses AI-powered tools to really help you create tons and tons of SEO-optimized content. They have an article writer, they have post ideas, it, has, it can generate post outlines for you. It can also, honestly, just write the entire article for you. And it can include keywords and links and images and all kinds of real-time data. Writeblogger.com is a game changer if you are a small business marketer. So there's a link in this episode's description. Be sure to click it. Go check it out. Again, I could not recommend this enough. It is a worthwhile investment. You will get your money's worth out of this in not even a month. In, in conceivably a day, you'll be able to generate like a month's worth of content. It's amazing. Okay, let's pop back in and catch back up with Jeff. So Jeff, I have a question for you as someone who has been in this industry for a long, long time. Um, and we're looking at talking about the demise of the, the cookie. Do you think that any, th there's any portion of Google's decision to eliminate the cookie was tied to basically crippling Facebook? Do you think that was in there at all? Do you think that was a factor? Well, am I, you these, know, is that you know, not really there? I, I think these large companies, they, you know, they make decisions that they're required to make under the guise of policy. So the cookie decision is towards privacy. Um, it, it definitely cripples, uh, you know, Facebook to a certain extent, but not so much. I think Apple's, update in a couple of iOSs ago with the ITP and the ATP where they, you know, where now you, the app, you have to get permission in order to track that was there by default. It's so great too. I can't, yeah. like now that you see that, like, I don't know who is clicking. Yes. It's right. so, it's very, it's unbelievable. very, very few people. So that had a huge impact to Facebook and, and, and really what's, 
what's interesting is that when you when you kind of step back from this and you look at analytics, if I'm a if I have an e-commerce store and let's say I do a thousand sales a day, and you know, I'm running on Facebook, I'm running on Google, maybe I'm running on Critio and a couple of other sites. And I look at my Facebook orders and Facebook says, you got 800, I, we got you 800 of the thousand. I look at Google and they say, we got you 800 of the thousand. Well, now I have 1600 orders. So is, as, the, as the VP of marketing, I need to somehow dedupe this because I can't, turn in a report to my boss that says we got 1600 orders, but I don't know where the other 600 are. And so, <laughs> yeah. Every, uh, everyone likes to report that kind of data. It's right. Great. So that's like, that's the big attribution problem is obviously there's, you know, and, and back in the early days, I used to say for every sale, if you're running with five partners, every, every sale is going to have five mothers or five fathers that are claiming this is my child pay me type of thing. <laughs> totally. And so, for a long time, what marketers have been doing is they've been giving uh, Facebook a haircut. So Facebook says 800, say, okay, you know, my best guess is 400, cut it in half. And that served marketers for a long time. And that way, it, when they turn in the report to their boss, it actually says a thousand orders. It makes sense. And, but then when Apple did the update, all of a sudden, Facebook was blind. Yeah. Facebook couldn't tell know. anymore. So same store, nothing's changed, but now all of a sudden Facebook, instead of reporting 800 orders is saying, we only got you 400 orders. And the problem is, is that the marketer is giving Facebook the same haircut, cutting it from 400 to 200. And so what our data has shown is that when this update went through Apple, the people who are using Facebook or Meta, it was Facebook and Instagram on a daily basis, they didn't all say, oh, I'm gonna leave Facebook for good. No, they're, they're all still there. That same demographic, people like 45, especially 55 plus, in fact, one of the most desirable demographics in the US, the ones who spend the most money, they are still- the rumors of Facebook demise have been, every year they ring the bell and every year it doesn't happen. That's not to say they're not struggling, but- That's right. Yes, they have, yeah, they have a very oh, desirable still, target market. In there. They're still there um, and still being very responsive. Uh, but the key is that people have been cutting their metrics in half. Now, the way around that that can help that is you have to do this server to server integration, which is a backend integration. Some of the larger e-commerce sites have done that. Most of the smaller ones have not. Uh, but I can tell you that it, the, those folks are still there. If all of a sudden you saw your numbers drop on Facebook, they didn't really drop. It's just that they're, they don't have the capability to be able to see through all the murkiness to figure out what's actually working anymore. Because uh, most of the people coming from Facebook are coming through mobile. And that's so that's do we feel like any of this cookie, these cookie updates or any of the other kind of, I'll say revolutions or changes that are coming are going to make any sort of improvement to attribution at all? Or is that always going to be uh, just a, a, an aspect of digital marketing that you continue to kind of that's that's that you work through? I mean, that's a great question. I mean, all of these changes and we, we even have more the new iOS update is reported to be stripping the uh, any PII personally identifiable data and any anything that tells you where that person came from. So there's some belief out there that it may be that when someone from a Mac or someone using Safari clicks through, you're not even going to be able to tell where they came where they came from in your wow. Google Analytics, even if you're buying ads. So this is this is pretty scary to marketers. So it, it's Things are really going backwards. So the answer to attribution today is that, you know, back in the days before digital, there was a technique called marketing mix modeling. And marketing mix modeling is a statistical technique that looks at correlations between how many impressions are in market, like how many people you're, you're trying to reach, how many people are seeing a TV ad, how many people are seeing your digital ads, directly to sales. And it looks at the contribution, which is essentially incrementality. But the problem is, is that it never went below that channel. So it could tell you 
how much your digital was doing, but it couldn't tell you search and it couldn't tell you specifically keyword or which Facebook ad or which creative. Attribution has always been very granular. And once you hooked it up, it was always running. Whereas marketing mix modeling was always this project that for most companies is usually around a half a million to several million dollars. And they would typically do it once a year at the most because it was such a heavy lift. So the future of attribution is in the middle of those two, meaning we're not going to have user level data, but using the data from the platforms that we take out of Facebook that you use for your reporting, the data that we can take out of, out of Google Analytics, the data that we can take out of Google and all these other providers, even though it's at a platform level, we can create very sophisticated models because the power of cloud computing, the number of cycles that we can run. So think, for example, like ChatGPT, AI, uh, that type of stuff, we couldn't have done that five years ago because the yeah. computers weren't fast enough. And if they could do it, it would not, they wouldn't have been able to afford to do it. But now you can do so much, so much faster. So we can actually take, and this is what we're doing at, at my company at Provalytics, we're taking all of that platform level data, analyzing it, and we're able to output attribution like results, very granular level. But on top of that, not only are we able to look at, because when you think about attribution, attribution is always about what happened yesterday. Meaning, hey, this is who's driving the most value. And most marketers, they use that to make decisions on where to spend their next dollar. So for example, if you look at a report, I'll give you an example. We had a report on a client and it said that greater than half the, vo the value was coming from their display ads. And TV wasn't that great. And they were like, we're spending so much money on TV. How can this be? How can this be? Because most marketers would look at that and say, let's double down. Let's spend a lot more money on display. But at Provalytics, what we do is in order to plan where the next dollar goes, the models go crazy with this machine learning AI. They go in and they do hundreds of thousands of simulations to figure out where should you place your next bet. And what it turned out is that when it comes to spending more money, we should not spend any more money in display, even though it's killing it because display is maxed out. We yeah. need to spend all of our next dollars in TV to build that upper part of the funnel. Yeah, I was just gonna say, it plays right into what you were talking about earlier is feeding the top of the funnel to grow the bottom of the funnel. I think that's, exactly. again, to your point where we focus so much on the bottom of the funnel, that's, it's, it's a lot more constricted than the top. And, right. and if, if you build the top, you will grow the top, you will grow the bottom. And I will say this, I, I am, I, I really love the, uh, the, the spark, the, everything that AI is bringing in from a content perspective. Um, obviously, you know, grain of salt, there's still all kinds of new workflows and SOPs that come with using AI for content generation. Um, but I, as far as training my clients, training my team, talking to people about it is, it is a tool and you need to understand how to properly wield the tool. You know, um, a hammer can do many great things, but it also can't do some things. It's the same thing with AI and it's going to change over time. Um, so my, I'm wondering, you know, or I guess what I'm more excited about is AI as it relates to analytics, because analytics are always the hard stop with a lot of my small business clients and a humongous beehive for large clients and large entities where it's just like, we have so much data, the attribution becomes difficult, the trying to figure out where to spend money becomes difficult, are we spending it in the right place? And for the small business marketer, it just gets into, well, I don't know what this means, right? right. The big business, unfortunately, no, again, reads too much into it oftentimes. <laughs> we have too much data, which is absolutely a thing. It's like too much data, and like now we're gonna really overthink it or the small business 
that may not have as much data, but doesn't know what to think of it. And I think AI and that cloud computing can start to solve both of those problems. And that's really exciting because the gone are the days, hopefully, or coming soon, where you're spending a week, a month on a report, right? right. I mean, I, I, if you take away that aspect of my job, that would actually, I, I, thank you. And you give me some <laughs> learnings that I can chew on. I'm not going to be, I'm not complaining too much about that. You know, um, well, I, would I tell think you it's that, great. That, you know, there's, for the small business person, uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff to look at, but what I always focus people to look at and to do are a couple of things, because there's a lot of levers that you pull when you're running a local business and you're doing a lot of things like you're sponsoring a soccer tournament. You, you, you spoke in an event at your local Toastmasters or, or some group. So what you want to do is you want to keep a log of anything you're doing where you're buying advertising, where you think, oh, I put a coupon in the Sunday mailer. Well, write that down. Keep a log. Keep a notebook of the dates that you do these things. Keep a notebook of the dates when you actually speak at events or you do anything like that in your local community. And then what you want to do is you want to look in your Google Analytics and you want to look at that organic traffic. Now, if you're if you're buying your Google uh, brand search term, you can look at that as well. But because the nice thing about your, if you're buying your Google brand search term in there, you can actually look at how many impressions each day are there for your business. Meaning how many people each day are actually searching for you? Because remember in Google analytics, you're only going to find out when they actually click through. So sometimes buying those Google brand search ads are great because you actually get to see how many people are searching each day. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go in and look and track that every day, what you want to do is keep it in a spreadsheet every day. How many people are searching? How many people are searching? Whoa, all of a sudden there were normally only 10 people a day searching and now there's a hundred. Well, wait a second. I did speak at that Toastmasters event last week. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out, okay, well maybe this is having an impact. So you put these things in notebooks and you track it that way you can actually tell what's moving the needle and what's actually not moving the needle. Obviously sales is, is the, is the end game, but really what we're looking for are these leading indicators. What, what is showing me, how do people find out about me? How are people walking? How do they know to walk into my store and tracking the dates of how many people search versus what I actually did. That's probably my best tip for that. All right, so one last digital marketing fire drill that I'm covering <laughs> with my guest, Jeff. Jeff, we're going to talk about Safari. Uh, people are freaking out. I took my son to the Animal Kingdom, actually, this past weekend for Father's Day, and we went on the Safari in Animal Kingdom, and he saw some giraffes. Didn't freak out. He <laughs> did, however, freak out over some ducks that he saw at the Animal Kingdom, which we also have at a pond half a block away from our house. I bring all this up just to say he didn't freak out on Safari, but a lot of people are freaking out about Safari. Why are people, and maybe more specifically digital marketers, freaking out about Safari? Well, because Safari and Apple are making even more rigid changes uh, than they did before. We talked earlier about the changes that they made for the in-app tracking uh, that really put the handcuffs on Facebook. Well, now what they're going to be doing is stripping the tracking links off of a URL. So what that means is, is that, you know, whenever you, you put in tracking links like the UTM links or any information in there, uh, and we're not sure exactly what they're going to be stripping out, uh, but the worst case scenario would be is that this could actually kill Google Analytics and Google Analytics 4 if they strip away all of those tracking links, because then you won't even know how people come to your website. And, and when you think about it, that is kind of the ultimate in privacy, the fact that you can go from website to website and people won't know how you got there. And that does kind of go along with the whole 
Apple mandate, but it is interesting that they're doing this right before uh, Google is going to be getting rid of cookies. So it's kind of like saying, hey, we're upping the game here for everyone. We're getting rid of these. And, and there's even talk now because function called private relay, which not too many people know, subscribe to I, iCloud, it's in there where uh, folks can't even tell your IP address. So if you're, if you've been in Google Analytics and you've been noticing that there's these private visitors, those are people on these relays. And even if you're digging in, if you have more sophisticated an analytics and you put on the relay and you're in your town and you would normally show up as being in Orlando, let's say, it'll show you in Kansas. And, and then you go back again five minutes later, it'll show you in another state. It, it, it's this whole relay system. And so now the next thing that people are talking about is that the browsers eventually will be hiding IP addresses. So that's really scary, but it does from a privacy aspect, it really makes the whole web much more private, much more secure for folks. It doesn't really help much with the ad ecosystem. It does mean that this whole ad personalization that the marketplace is all built is going to have to shift. But, you know, it, you kind of have to weigh it out. You know, do I want my privacy or do I want ads that really speak to me? How do you toe this line? How do you, how do you personally toe this line as a marketer and, and an analytics person? Like, because I, I struggle with it. I do want more privacy, but right. like, it's like, I'm, I'm constantly taking one hat on and one hat off where it's like, Ooh, I like good privacy. It's like, Oh, but that, okay. Like as a marketer. And, and I would say this as a responsible marketer, right. Um, right. you know, I don't feel like I've ever made abuse of any of that, that data, that kind of thing. But yeah, then you lose personalized ads. You know, it's like, would I rather have personalized ads versus non-personalized ads? I, I mean, I think I always feel like I fall more on the line of personalized ads than not. I'd rather see an ad for something that's relevant than not, I guess. So how do you kind of wrestle with these kind of competing concepts? Well, going back to what we talked about earlier, where how this data has actually led us down a rabbit hole of less ad effectiveness. There's been a lot of research in, in the concept of when you're reading content and you know each piece of content, and in fact, the research was originally done on TV ads uh, by a good friend of mine and a pioneer in the industry by the name of Bill Harvey. And what they found is that TV ads or, or, or TV programs each program has a certain emotional state that you can determine. Is it funny? Is it scary? Uh, and what brands found years ago is that, you know, soda doesn't sell well in drama, but it sells really well in comedy. And they've been oh able God. to demonstrate wow. that when your product and the ad aligns with the emotional state of the, the content, and TV that they're consuming, sales go up and they go up dramatically. And they've also extended this study to the internet as well and to news content. In fact, there's been companies out there that have used bills, they're called driver tags, these emotional driver tags, what drive us to do things. They've classified all of the top thousand plus news sites and they, and they are able to determine the emotional state of articles and Advertisers are able to then buy ads, not based on personalization, but based on the content and sales go up. Wow. And this is the part that we talked about earlier that's been forgotten and where marketers have gotten lazy, which is, you know, because we have all this data, we think we have all the information. We think we know everything, but we forgot about this concept called emotion <laughs> and how yeah, human beings so are true. driven by emotion. And so, we need to align the messaging with the state that people are in. And when we do that, uh, we can sell more widgets. It's really simple. Um, and, and that's really what it comes down to. And, and that's why this personalization is something, the problem we run into is that we have an entire 
uh, working group, every working marketer today who's under the age of 50 is addicted to this user level data. And so we have to go through an entire re-education process. In fact, I'm working now on a series of videos to help people understand all of the changes and challenges and what, what the new world is going to look like as we come through into 2024, because it's going to be completely different. And what's going to happen is that without education, people are going to latch on to these cookie lists, supposedly cookie list solutions, which are going to get a lot of attention. They're going to get a lot of money. But then what's going to happen is the hammer is going to come down from Google and from Apple to stop these from happening. And then people are going to be like, what, 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 what am I going to do? Yeah. I'm just, and, and so we have to start this re-education process it's now. It's the tail think, wagging the dog there, right? You that's think you're exactly just right. Their mercy, which, you know, playing in, I always say it's like playing in their playgrounds. You know, you, they do have rules posted, but they can also change the equipment at any time. And that, that's part of the ongoing change of digital. But I want to right. step back just as we wrap up here. You, you said something that rare, well, rarely happens on the podcast, but you really blew my mind when you said marketers forgot about emotion. And that got me to think about the ads that I get served and that I see, that all of us see on a daily basis, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube. So many of them now are completely devoid of that aspect. They're all right. about, I mean, it really just when you said that brought home everything we've talked about, because they're all just about the, the buy now, here it is, ready to buy, go, go, go. So few of them are hitting on touching on doing the work to address the emotional connection aspect solutions, um, you know, hitting the fears, frustrations, problems, the transformation that a product or service can have. And not everything needs to be a life changer, you know, a simple gardening tool that makes my life easier will transform me into a much better state than I was before. You know, it doesn't all have to be, you know, this completely massively life changing type thing, but it can be transformational and positive and people buy off that. And pe that's how you make these solid connections. And I just wanted to stop and just, I challenge you, as, you know, the listener to just kind of be aware of that next time you're in these platforms, look at the ads that are coming up you'll probably notice how few of them are hitting on any sort of emotional. Um, I would even say, again, we talked about a little bit more brand centric type of ads. And there's so much more about that bottom funnel. Like, Hey, buy this, Hey, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this. And that's where it is. Um, and so, Again, I challenge you. That's your homework, listeners. Uh, I want to just thank Jeff. Thank you so much, Jeff Greenfield. This has been amazing. Before we go, Jeff, where can people find you? How can they connect with you? Um, how you know? Who do you work with? How can they work with you? Fire away, plug away, anything and anywhere people can find you. Yeah, they can go to Provalytics.com. That's uh, my company's website. Uh, go there, check it out. And the the audio series or the video series that I'm working on, uh, which will be live very soon, is attributioncertified.com. We're setting up a certification service uh, for folks to go through and very quickly get up to speed on all of these changes and understand how to make the best decisions. So that's attributioncertified.com. Awesome. Yeah. And listen, I thank you for taking the time out. This has been such an amazing conversation. And um, for those of you out there, whether, you know, whatever level of marketer you are, as we said at the beginning of the show, digital marketing is constantly changing. 
But as we sit here recording this June of 2023, we are really, I think, at the beginning of a lot of different revolutions, transformations happening at once. And I'm excited by it. And, you know, I know Jeff is also. And I think that's the beauty of digital marketing and the thing that keeps me keeps me doing it is you never have the same day twice right. never experience a groundhog day in digital marketing um so again i want to say thank you to jeff uh go check out his website uh there will be links in the uh, episode description and also in the show notes you can find that at marketingclaritypodcast.com and until next time, as always, I encourage you to keep pedaling.